I'm gonna bring you in on a little known secret. If you open band-aids or little bandage wrappers in the dark, certain band-aids glow. I am not making this up. Right at the bottom where the two wrappers meet as you're pulling them apart, you see a thin glowing blue line. And it's a really interesting little known type of luminescence. And hopefully by the end of this lesson, we're gonna understand why it happens. Hello, I'm Diana Cowern and welcome to lesson 18 of Diana's intro physics class. Today is our first lesson on electricity. I am of course very excited because we've talked about literally one fundamental force for this entire course and there are four fundamental forces but we've only discussed gravity. So today I finally get to talk about the electromagnetic force. Today's theme is secrets because I'm going to reveal the secret mechanism that your car door uses to shock the crap out of your finger. I'm just kidding. It's not a secret. It's in a bazillion textbooks. Did you know that x-rays that show your broken foot at the doctor's office are the exact same phenomenon as the light shining from this flashlight? That's right. Radio waves that carry your radio station signal, the Bluetooth frequencies that your wireless headphones use, they are light. Microwaves that heat your food, light. Infrared heat, light. Red light, light. All of these things are the same thing, and that blew my freaking mind the first time that I learned it. What are they all? They are all electromagnetic waves. It just so happens we can only see a small portion of the spectrum of these electromagnetic waves. So now I know your next question is, you know that a sound wave travels through air. You know that a seismic wave in an earthquake moves through the ground. So what medium does a light wave travel through? You might say air, but we just established that that's what sound waves travel through. And get this, light can travel through the vacuum of space. If you were a scientist in the 19th century, how would you have figured out what medium light moves through? You knew at the time that all other known waves traveled through some medium, so you assume light should travel through a medium as well. And people are calling that medium the luminiferous ether. And of course, they couldn't tell you what it was, but pretty much everyone was convinced that it permeated the entire universe. So how could you test for it? How could you test whether this all-present ether existed? If nothing immediately comes to mind, that's okay. It's a pretty legendary experiment that finally settled it. In 1887, these two guys named Michelson and Morley built a contraption where you bounce light waves back and forth this way and then perpendicular this way and see how the light interferes when it comes back. This concept is called an interferometer and it lets you compare the path distance one wave goes versus the other. Because when they come back, they interfere. And if say one wave went further than expected, then something's happening. So the idea was if earth is moving through the ether, you would see some change in the speed of light along one direction as it moves through the ether wind. It's kind of like, if you're in a car moving along a road that, like say the road is a conveyor belt, then that would change the speed you're actually traveling in the car. Same concept. Fun fact, this is the same technology that LIGO currently uses to detect gravitational waves. But back then, for Michelson and Morley, in what was maybe the biggest failed physics experiment of all time, they found nothing. There was no measurable difference. There was no ether. This was the biggest deal. Because if there was no ether, then what is the medium that light traveled through? The strange answer we know now is that there isn't one. Today we think about light not as a wave traveling in a medium, but rather as, get this, a disturbance in something called the electromagnetic field. Dude, what on earth is a field? So the electromagnetic field is a type of force field. Yes, it's true, force fields, they are real. In fact, you're standing in a force field, or I suppose you might be sitting, but you're sitting in a gravitational force field. I'm gonna show you with some math that you already know, a way to think about what fields are. So take Newton's equation for gravity, which you already know, F equals gmm over r squared. The gravitational force between two masses, big M and little m, is gmm over r squared. So let's divide both sides by little m. These cancel, and I get f over m equals gm over r squared equals f over m. That's a from f equals ma. So on Earth, this value f over m, or gm over r squared, is little g, or 9.81 meters per second squared. And that's true, but what if we thought about this in a different way? Imagine putting an object some distance away from some planet like Earth. So I'm gonna draw Earth. I've got a little object, a distance r away from the center of Earth. 
So this equation represents the gravitational force per unit mass. So the force per unit mass at this point, or this point, or this point, is going to have some magnitude that will be equal to g times m, which is the mass of Earth, or whatever your planet is, divided by your distance away squared. And that force is a vector that's always going to be pointing toward the center of the Earth. It's radially symmetric. And as you move further away, the force per unit mass still always points toward the center of the planet, but the magnitude of the force per unit mass gets smaller. What I've just described is a gravitational field. The field tells me that for a given mass, like little m, in some location at r, what the gravitational force is going to be. It's a vector field, so it has a direction. In this case, every single point will point toward the center of Earth. But if my object is here at some distance away and say it has a mass of 10 kilograms, I just multiply the value of my field by 10 kilograms and boom, out comes the force. A field has some value everywhere and a vector has that, but also a direction everywhere. In physics, we have all sorts of similar vector fields changing throughout space. These fields also usually have some sort of symmetry, often a radial symmetry like this. And actually, it's not just two-dimensional, it's radially symmetric around a sphere. And you guessed it, the electromagnetic field is one of these radial vector fields. Just as a mass produces a gravitational field, an electric charge produces an electromagnetic vector field. The electromagnetic field describes the electromagnetic force per unit charge throughout space. This means we need to talk about electric charges. You probably know that there are two types of charges, where opposite charges attract and like charges repel. And ever since Benjamin Franklin in the 18th century, we called the two types of electric charges positive and negative. So this will be the field for an electron, which has the opposite charge, so the arrows point in opposite direction. It is, by the way, completely arbitrary that we call protons positive and electrons negative. We just do it because that's what Ben did. So we now describe electric charges using the SI unit called the Coulomb. So the charge on the proton, pretty random number. Wouldn't expect you to guess it off the top of your head. But for a positive charge proton, it is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulombs. The electron's much smaller, so it must be a lot smaller, right? No, the electron charge is exactly the opposite of the proton charge. It's negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. This is so weird. The electron is an elementary particle, meaning that it can't be broken down anymore, whereas the proton is made up of three quarks. They're two very different objects, but it just so happens they have the same exact charge. So how many electrons are protons in one coulomb of charge? Turns out you would need 6.3 times 10 to the 18 protons, or 6.3 times 10 to the 18 electrons to get one coulomb. <laughs> so that gives you some scale. Why so big? Well, because when they were defining the SI units in the late 19th century, they didn't know about protons and electrons. So today we can actually manipulate single protons and single electrons. But back then they were dealing with huge amounts of charge. So now we have to work with coulombs for the same reason that Chemists are stuck with moles. What is that, like 10 to the 23, something like that? Sorry, chemists. We feel you. Solidarity. So coulombs of charge, they'll push and pull each other. And we have a tool for calculating how big that force is. Just like Newton's law of gravitation, but for electric charges instead of masses. So our friend, Mr. Charles Augustine de Coulomb, the guy that the electric charge is named after, gave us something called Coulomb's law. So it is F equals K, big Q, little q over r squared. Force between any two charged objects is proportional to their charges, q and q, and inversely proportional to the square of their distances, r squared, and with a proportionality constant, k. k has a value of nine times 10, whoops, to the ninth Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. This looks a whole lot like Newton's law of gravitation. Yeah, they're both radio fields, but it's interesting that they both are linearly proportional to the charge or the masses and inversely proportional to the radius squared. I don't know. Interesting to me that this looks so much like gravity. Moving on. So we can use Coulomb's law to calculate the force between a proton and an electron. So we'll, we'll make the distance 
appropriately small. Let's put the proton a nanometer away from the electron. So my radius is going to be 10 to the minus 9 meters away. So this distance is about 20 times further away than the electron and the proton are in the ground state of a hydrogen atom, which is known as the Bohr radius. So the force in this case is going to be um, my, k, my k, so 9 times 10 to the 9th newton meters squared per coulomb squared times my two charges. And they're the same magnitude, so I'm just going to square it. And remember to add a negative. So I'm going to put the negative in front. 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And then over my distance squared, my 10 to the minus 9 meters squared. If I do add all this math, I end up with negative 2.3 times 10 to the minus 10 newtons. This is the force exerted back and forth, proton on electron, electron on proton, <laughs> when they are one nanometer apart. That is about a fifth of a nanonewton. It is incredibly small. But remember, the mass of a proton and electron are also incredibly small. What I want to actually do right now is calculate the force of gravity between the two charges. So, so my proton mass, the mass of the proton is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And the electron mass is about a thousand times lighter at 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So if we compare this electric force to the gravitational force between them, we would get force of gravity is G, which is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meters squared per kilogram squared times my mm, my mass of the proton, times the mass of the electron, plug these in, into the minus 9 meters squared. All these calculations, and I get 1.0 times 10 to the minus 49 newtons. Woohoo! That is way smaller. That is a tiny gravitational pull. I wanted to point out something on our force calculation. Notice that we put a negative sign in one of the charges because the electron has a negative charge, which means that the force is negative. So that negative sign means that this is an attractive force, which totally makes sense because we know opposite charges attract. If we had done the same calculation, but the charges were identical, like two protons, then the electric force would be the exact same magnitude, but it would be positive, meaning that it would be a repulsive force. This is the big difference between the electromagnetic force and gravity. Gravity is always attractive under normal circumstances. Whereas the electromagnetic force can be positive or negative. So it can be attractive or repulsive. I said under normal circumstances for gravity always being attractive because there's actually some hypothetical situations in which you get a repulsive form of gravity in the early, early universe. There's this theorized period of time where the universe expanded at this insane rate of expansion called cosmic inflation. That's what the period of time was called. And it's theorized that this inflation was caused by a repulsive form of gravity. Crazy. We can apply all these ideas to talk about the electromagnetic fields generated by charged objects. So if I asked you now to tell me about some electromagnetic fields, you could do it, right? And by tell me, I mean describe them using math. Nah? Okay, I'll help you. But first, let me show you a fun little demo to get us in the mood. So when you weren't looking, I stuck some tape here on the wall of our Magic Science Space Bus 3000. And I'm going to pull it off. Ha! <laughs> okay, you can do this too by sticking tape to the walls of your space bus or to some plastic. Once you rip the tape off of the plastic, they will repel each other. I don't know if you can see that, but I'm trying to make the bottom touch and it will not. <laughs> ah! So what I did was make an electromagnetic field on this tape and it's repelling the charges on this tape and vice versa. Field on this tape and it's repelling the charges on this tape. That's pretty cool. But this is pretty hard to model. So what about modeling the electromagnetic field of a proton? Just like with gravity above where we divide it out by the little m, we're going to start with Coulomb's law which you now know is F equals K Q Q over R squared. And we're going to divide both sides by Q to get the force per unit charge. So we're going to get F over the little Q. This is like my unit charge and I'm going to get K big Q over R squared. This is my electric field for the proton. It looks like the one we drew before, 
but the field is going to be repulsive by default, which is the opposite of gravity, which is attractive by default. So if I put another positively charged object in this field, it will feel a force radially away from the proton. The further away I move that charge from the proton, the smaller the force gets by one over the radius squared. So if I put a negative charge in here, the sign of the force is going to flip and that charge feels an attractive force. This is what we mean by the electromagnetic field. More specifically, this is the electric field. We haven't included any magnetism yet. But the electric field tells us how much force a charge would feel at a particular location, R. Twice as much charge in there, so you increase Q, and you get twice as much force. So if we want to be fancy, the electric field is a vector representation of the force per charge that a charge would feel when put near another charge. Got it? Great. So besides a single proton, another classic example of an electric field is actually quite close to the tape demo that we did, because it involves two conducting plates where charges can accumulate. That's actually what I did with the tape. I, when I ripped it off the plastic, I actually ripped electrons off the wall and the tape became negatively charged. So then the negative charges on both strips of tape repelled each other. Which reminds me of an excellent joke. So one atom says to another, I've lost an electron. And the second atom says, are you sure? The first atom replies, I'm positive. <laughs> okay, so two conducting plates. Do, do, do some distance apart. They could be two sheets of tin foil or two metal, metal sheets. So these are real objects, you could really do this. So we attach a battery to these two sheets, one end to the positive side of the battery and one end to the negative side, then what's gonna happen? Well, on the negative side, a lot of electrons are gonna pile up on the sheet and so you're gonna get a bunch of negative charges. And on the positive side, the electrons are gonna leave behind some lonely protons. So we're gonna get a bunch of lonely protons giving an imbalance of charge, more negative over here, more positive over here. So now we have an imbalance of charge with electrons on one side, protons on the other. And each proton is gonna have an electric field radiating out like this. And each electron, because it's negative, is gonna have the same kind of field, but opposite, where it's going inward towards the charges. So what ends up happening is that all of the sideways pointing fields cancel, and so you end up getting this field that's actually all in one direction. And now, where in here do you think the field is the strongest? Let's say A, B, or C. It is a trick question. They are all the same strength electric field. Except at the edges over here where the plates end, you get a constant electric field between the two charged plates. Typically when you do this kind of electrically charged plate problems, you have plates that are a lot longer than the distance between them, so you can ignore the edges. So no matter where you put another charge in between the two plates, it's going to feel the exact same force. If you get further away from the protons, well, you get closer to the electrons. So the protons are pushing, if you're a positive charge, and the electrons are attracting or pulling, if you're a positive charge. So it all balances out. So you get this constant electric field in here, all going this direction. Which means that if I throw an electron in here, zoop, it'll go that way. If I throw a proton in here, zoop, it's gonna go that way. So this setup is actually something you probably have hundreds of in your pocket right now. It's a super common electronics component called a capacitor. And it's one of the fundamental electrical components of modern electrical technology. So your phone very likely has hundreds of them, along with resistors and transistors. So, Let's stick a little electron in here and see what happens. Well, it's going to be pushed as we, as we established before, which means that it won't just move, it's going to accelerate because it feels a constant force. So say we measure the force on that electron, which would be really hard to do. I don't know. Maybe you can think about an experimental setup to figure out the force on the electron. But say we measure and we know that the force on the electron is 7.0 times 10 to the minus 14 newtons. So from that, we can figure out the electric field strength inside this capacitor. So what is it? What's the electric field strength? Well, before we did the radial electric field, F over Q equals KQ over R squared, but this isn't radial anymore. This is a constant linear electric field. But I can use the same concept, F over Q equals my electric field. 
I'm just going to call it E. And this is another this is another model. E, this electric field can be any type of field. It can be radial. We could just have it be a constant and that means it's linear. It could be it could be all types of crazy geometries. But right now, it's constant. So to find E, I'm just going to divide the force 7.0 times 10 to the minus 14 newtons by my charge. And what charge am I going to use? I'm going to use the charge of the electron because that's what I put in there, an electron. And you know the charge of the electron is negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. I get negative 4.4 times 10 to the 5 newtons per coulomb. And the units of the electric field, or you can use volts per meter. Whole new unit now, the volt. Something we're going to get to a little bit more in next lesson. So about 4.4 times 10 to the minus 5 newtons per coulomb. What strength does that correspond to? Well, if it were about 10 times stronger, then it would be a strong enough electric field that you would actually get a spark through the air if this were sitting in the air. Typically we think of these capacitors as being in a vacuum because air actually affects the electric field, but imagine I had an electric field that strong across air. The electrons would be pulled so strongly toward the positive side, they would get, they would jump across the air. And that's actually what happens with the band-aid that I talked about at the very beginning of all this. When you're pulling apart those pieces, you create such a big charge imbalance, positive charges building up on one side, negative charges building up on the other side, such a strong charge imbalance that electrons jump across through the air, and when that happens, you see a spark. That's what a spark is. So now we understand why band-aids glow. Maybe not all of it, but enough. So that's the electric field. I know that we didn't talk much about magnetic fields, but they are very closely related, and we didn't get a chance here to go in depth, but they're two sides of the same fundamental force coin. And in fact, there are great resources out there that I suggest you search for that teach you how the magnetic field is actually the electric field kind of in a different reference frame. I didn't learn any of that until I got to relativity in college. But anyway, we started this video talking about electromagnetic waves. So how do you create waves in the electromagnetic field? Well, this animation shows you how. What we have here is a radio station on one side, so basically an antenna, and then some distance away you have a house with another radio antenna. What happens is the radio station is basically just jiggling electrons up and down in a metal wire. So it's an alternating current, if you will. So you can see when the electron jiggles, the electric field changes. So sometime later, the electron in the other antenna, that one also starts to jiggle. Why? Because it's feeling the force field change. The electrons are responding to that change in the electric field. And if you watch the amplitude of the electromagnetic field carefully, you see that the electric field is oscillating like a wave through space. And you can see the electron in the antenna responding to that oscillating electric field. There it is. This is the electromagnetic wave that we spent this entire video building towards. That wave is light. And that, my friends, is today's lesson on electromagnetism. When they ask what you learned on YouTube today, here are your two key takeaways. Number one, the electromagnetic force between two objects is proportional to their charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. F equals KQQ over R squared. And number two, light is a wave in the electromagnetic field. And light carries the information that charges have accelerated. And don't forget to go practice these problems. Here are all the problems we did in today's lesson. Go do them on your own because that is the best way to learn physics. Actually to learn most things. And now here's something super cool. Something related to light and Einstein and relativity, which I talked about. Early experiments about the nature of light also led to two other really famous insights from Einstein in 1905, which was that the failure of physicists to find any, any evidence for the ether gave credence to the mind-bending idea of special relativity. Crazy kinds of physics. At the same time, Einstein proposed the idea that light is not just a wave disturbing the electromagnetic field, it can also be seen as a particle called the photon, which I mentioned earlier, and now we know that all sorts of fields are associated with particles, like the Higgs boson, which is the particle associated with the Higgs field and was one of the biggest discoveries of the century, discovered in 2012, or the yet undiscovered graviton, the particle associated with the gravitational field. 
We've never confirmed that the graviton exists because we can't measure it since the gravitational field is so weak. But you never know. Maybe someone who builds an interferometer the size of the solar system will do it. It could be you. And if you continue on with physics, which I certainly hope you do, you could study physics like that. And now for a message for you from a special guest. Hi, I'm Vanessa from the YouTube channel Braincraft, and this is a message for all of the beautiful physics nerds who are watching Diana's intro to AP Physics course. I've learned a lot, I hope you are learning a lot, and I have one more thing to share with you, which is that I actually studied science at university, it was super fun, and it has led to all kinds of unimaginably cool things that I have done in my life since I graduated. I have taught astronomy in Papua New Guinea and all around Australia, I actually worked as an astronomy tours manager, so as a science tour guide in the tourism industry, and every night I got paid to look up at a blanket of stars in the Australian outback night sky, use all kinds of big telescopes and show planets and deep sky nebulae and all kinds of cosmic phenomena to the guests that were staying at this resort. It was super cool and it goes to show that there are all kinds of jobs that you can't even imagine in STEM. I did that, I've done a bunch of other things and now I am a YouTuber. So there you go. I hope you have learned a lot from everything because you know what? Learning is fun. I love it. And I love you too.